You are tuning in to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. Trick or treat, Lone Star Radio listeners. This is Dick, the general manager, taking this quick moment to remind you that Lone Star Community Radio is looking to fill some of our talk show slots along with some of our DJ slots. We have a new show airing on the 10th Making Connections with Stacey Harris, which will air every second Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Make sure to check it out along with our other programs on Lone Star Community Radio. More information on Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. And again, if you're interested in doing something with us, call the station, 936-647-3776. Thanks for checking out this recording, and I hope you guys enjoy. Good afternoon. Welcome to this glorious Friday, the 13th. Uh, my name is Michael Potter. I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent here for Montgomery County. And uh, I work with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And uh, we're, you know, sitting out here enjoying the weather and, and uh, enjoying this lovely day. But I hope that uh, everybody's uh, got plans for this weekend. Of course, we have the uh, Conroe Catfish Festival this weekend and stuff going on downtown here in Conroe. Uh, I know that one of the things we're going to talk about today is uh, our master gardener, our volunteer group, is having a huge plant sale, our fall fundraising plant sale this weekend. Uh, it starts uh, tomorrow morning, in fact. Uh, we start at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning uh, where we give a uh, one-hour presentation, kind of to talk a little bit about the plants and everything, and then we start our plant sale at 9 o'clock. Um, a couple of things, you know, we're going to kind of, I'm going to talk a little bit more, a little bit later about some of the plants. Uh, I was hoping my cohort would be here today, Bob Daly, but I think that he kind of ran into the same situation that I did as far as parking. Uh, it gets to be a little cumbersome over here with a big activity like this going on. So um, he, he may pop in here in just a little bit, just a, uh, just a little late, but we'll, we'll keep rolling anyway. But uh hope everybody's doing good. And uh, we had a, a couple, you know, eventful weeks here uh, with you know the lack of rain but we had some good cold fronts come through that kind of cooled us down and so we're starting to see some things out in people's uh, lawns with uh, when it just when it's uh, in reference to large patch and um, we're still having some infestations of uh, the tropical sod webworms and uh, you know for both of those uh, of course it's two different treatments insect versus a fungus so it's very important to uh, identify the issue correctly to begin with uh, so you may choose the right uh, treatment or try right product in order to uh, control those issues <clears throat> uh, as far as the tropical sod webworms they uh, all of a sudden after harvey uh, we right before harvey actually they they started to kind of have a big uh, spike in populations we were seeing a lot of the adult moths and uh, right soon after that, uh, Harvey hit, it kind of slowed us down a little bit. But right after, uh, the notice that the population started to come back up and we were getting lots of uh, samples coming to the office where we were identifying the larva stages that were chewing on the grass. And uh, basically what happens is that the grass ends up being a little, it almost kind of looks mowed in a sense. The end uh, starts to kind of look like a brown patch or what they call brown patch, large patch situation starts to discolor. And uh, so we were seeing some of that start to occur and people were kind of wondering, you know, hey, is it large patch or is it, you know, take all or what is it going on? So uh, we were starting to see those moths again. And uh, so we, we found out that, you know, there's those uh, stinking little worms. What, what can we do to fight this? Yeah. Well, the best thing to do is, is take an active approach as far as control. Um, you know, what happens, they do the damage now. And then in the spring, it's going to take longer for that grass to recover. So the best thing right now is to try to hit it with some type of insecticide that'll that'll control them. And uh, these guys are a little tricky though; they like to party at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they come out uh, late in the evening. The best time to put a spray application is probably right around dusk, because okay. that's when they come out. And there's not just an insecticide like um, like a product that has carbaryl in it or uh, permethrin or bifenthrin those are some of the synthetic type chemicals uh, if you use something like bt which is bacillus thuringiensis it's a bacteria that they ingest and it kind of gives them a little bit of heartburn they don't forget so it, do we want to do we want to try to get rid of them before the cold comes around is that the, the yeah. objective yeah the objective is to get rid of them before the cold front because what's going to happen is that of course with all those populations and everything else you'll have more of a population next year okay because they're, they're going to be kind of they're going to go into dormancy stage 
and they're going to be ready for next season. So they'll come out even in more mass numbers if we have a kind of a wet spring. And then you'll be fighting even more of an uphill battle come spring with the grass. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, the best thing to do is go ahead and do one of those applications, spray applications late in the evening. Um, the difference is, is you need to break the life cycle. Okay. Okay, so you got to spray late in that evening, you know, right about dusk. And then about, you know, follow the label. That's always what I tell people, follow the label. Uh, some, some of those products are seven to ten day treatments in between. But the idea is to break that life cycle, kill those larvae so you don't have those adults coming out and regenerating more yeah. you know, eggs and stuff like that. So, and the same thing goes, and it's a little bit more intensive actually when you go to move to BT, uh, Bacillus sterogensis. Um, since it's a bacteria and it's, it's a powder type form, they have to ingest it. And, and so that means they have to actively be feeding to get it, and that kills them. If you spray it out there and it sits there for about five to seven days, it starts to go away. It just kind of loses its effectiveness. So how, how is a, a – not a consumer, but how, how is a, somebody who's facing this issue, how do they know when they're feeding? Is there a, a way to tell? Or Yeah, it, it basically – it'll look like the grass is mowed, and on closer appearance, you, you can get up closer to it, you can actually see chew marks in the, the grass. grass. Yeah, it'll be like little little bitty indentions where you can see where they've chewed like any worm would chew anything. Yeah. But yeah. And it'd be have, we had a lady bring in a leaf blade that's about six inches tall and had all these little rounds, <laughs> you know, kinda parts taken out of it and she's like, I don't know what's eating it and I'm like, well, it's not a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so but they had these they have a lot of them going on right now. There's a lot of people you know, they hide out in the daytime, they're in the landscapes, you know, up in the the shrubbery and up in the ground cover and stuff yeah. like that. And then they, they fly around and then lay stuff at night and, and they come out at night and eat feed. So, and I haven't, uh, the thing with BT though, is it, it takes about five days. You need to respray. If it rains, you got to respray. <laughs> so it's, it's a little more intensive. Uh, and I think at some point, you know, if you have that big of an infestation you're using IPM strategies, you need to go out there, which is integrated pest management. It's basically having all these tools in your tool belt. Sometimes a chemical is more, a, you know, a better choice than a, a a natural product that takes more time, that is a little bit more time consuming. So having a good knockdown on those insects will help you as far as your spring. Can you get things. can you get like a BTE at you know Home Depot Lowe's sort of situation? Yeah, any yeah. of those box stores have it. Um, a lot of the nor- local nurseries do. I think or- Ortho makes one that's like a BT worm killer, and, and they all should be. Are they, kind of labeled the same. Are they expensive or? No, no, they're not that expensive. Uh, most time you buy it in a concentrated formulation, so one of those bottles will last you quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that's that's the best thing. Just, you know, keep it stored in a cool, dry place, and, you know, you got it for next season when they come pop back up in your yard again. You know, they start. It, bound to, right? Right. <laughs> yep. So, you know, that's one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of lately. Um, and then every now and then we get the phone call on, you know, I think I've got that large patch. Well. They say brown patch, but we say large patch. You guys know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's one of those things. Uh, they changed it over the years. Um, brown patch and large patch are basically the same thing, except there's a it's a strain of Rhizoctonia, which is a strain A and a strain B. Mm. Strain A, which is brown patch, is affects typically the cool season grasses, which we don't grow any down here. Yeah. We're warm season. So they go, call it go figure, go figure. Yeah. They call it large patch. The only, what the only cool season was 36 hours of 32 below. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we've got those situations and, and it is what it is, but when we, we typically get these cool nights, um, and you know, not so hot days when we have cooler temperatures and moisture and humidity, you start to get that, that inflection. You can start to get all that, uh, that growth of that fungal, fungal mats and stuff like that. So the good thing about brown patch is it's just, weather related it'll go away right it'll okay. go away once it dries out or once the weather conditions change it'll go away do you see a lot of people like i guess panicking when they see it and trying to treat yeah. it oh and... yeah exactly it's it's oh my gosh i've got the, my grass is turning <laughs> somewhat brown <laughs> just remember brown's a color too yeah and and that's you know that's the whole thing about turf grass is it, it is finicky um you know brown patch is one of those things that'll go away with time uh, changing the conditions. If you're watering a lot right now, I can completely understand why you would think that it's still a good time, but we're starting to move into that fall situation where nighttime temperatures are cool. The grass is slowing its growth. You're not having to mow as often. Yeah. So therefore the water should be reduced. So it, it, what if somebody wants to say like, 
hey, let's go throw some fertilizer on it. Would yeah. you, I mean, that would be a big uh, no-no, right? Yeah, it would be a big no-no. Because they're like, oh, my grass needs food because it's browning. Well, and it actually and it actually says that this. If my grass is ground, browning and, and I'm going to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to throw out a fertilizer, it's what type of fertilizer you use. Okay. If you throw a high nitrogen or too much fertilizer out at one point in time, you're actually like throwing gasoline on a fire. Yeah. So any kind of fungal issues will just be accelerated as far as its growth. What's an example of like a high nitrogen one? You know, ammonium sulfate, which is 2100, okay, okay is, is its numbers. 21 being the nitrogen, zero being the phosphorus, and then zero being potassium. Okay. <clears throat> that's just a, that's a fertilizer that's out there. It's not a general recommendation for our area, but it's one that's out there that's high what about, nitrogen. What about like a Scott's? Yeah. Because like that's a popular brand, and I feel like a yeah. lot of people use it. So. Yeah. I, you know, our recommendation is always don't use weed and feed type products. Um, we, we just – our timing can be so off from year to year as yeah. far as when it's time to fertilize and when it's time to put a weed, con, you know, a pre-emergent out. Um, the biggest thing is, is that no matter what fertilizer you try to use, a good 3-1-2 ratio would be beneficial. Okay. Um, I always kind of joke with people, but it's not a joke. I don't fertilize. And my yard looks just as good as everybody else's. <laughs> I don't water, and it looks just as good as everybody else's. And I have a lot of my master gardeners that go, really? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Nope, not kidding you. I don't do those things. But it's just, just it's strategic, right? Yeah, it's strategic. In, in what, everything you do. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, everything has a purpose. You know, I use a mulching mower. Mm -hmm. So all those leaf blades and everything become compost and become organic matter for the soil. Whenever I get leaves fall from my trees, I mow over them. That becomes compost. That becomes natural nutrients mm -hmm. that just regenerates. So, you know, yeah, it doesn't – you're not completely exempt from having issues no matter what you do. It's – that's turf grass. Yeah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, I know people down here uh, – I, I feel like a lot of them say, that, oh, I want to switch to Bermuda. Yes. Like, that's the solution. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like Bermuda has a lot of problems that come along with it as well. Uh, we got stories on that. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Um, you know, we got trees. We got trees. I'll tell you what, what, after a break here, we'll, uh, we'll finish up. i got a good story to tell you about a friend of ours, a friend of mine, family and everything that called up recently. So, Perfect. Well, guys, thanks for joining us today. I'm Michael Potter, the horticulture agent for Montgomery County. We'll be back in a moment. A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Extension Hour. My name is Michael Potter. I'm the horticulture agent here with Montgomery County, and we're talking a little bit about turf grasses and stuff and, and talking about some of the issues we've seen lately. And also, uh, a little bit later on the show, I'll talk about our big old volunteer program, uh, Master Gardeners, our plant sale tomorrow that, that, that's coming, our fall fundraiser. Uh, we were talking earlier about, you know, uh, turf grasses, and, and it was brought up about Bermuda, you know. Bermuda is, is is kind of underutilized, but I wouldn't necessarily grow it up here unless I had a full sun situation. That's the only time. And basically, I, when I teach about turf grasses, I always talk about greenest to brownest. <laughs> and uh, you, if you look at the turf grasses, typically St. Augustine stays greenest the longest. Mm -hmm. You know, there's really no sense of. I mean, you can maybe have 50% green during the winter months. Uh, but with some of your uh, your Bermudas and Zoysias and some of these other grasses, they will actually go dormant for a longer period of time. They just can't withstand, since they're a warm season grass, they really can't stand those cold temperatures. So they go to a more dormant color. Uh, Bermudas are like that. Um, the thing that we have up here that most people don't realize is we have trees. We have shade. Lots of it. Mm, lots of it. And uh, where they th just think about it. If, if a plant gets all of its nutrients and, and carbohydrates and everything from the leaves, um, then that's its only source to survive. So you have thin-bladed grass and you have thick-bladed grass, revert the difference between Bermuda and, and St. Augustine. So St. Augustine can definitely catch more sunlight. Mm -hmm. So the thinner black grass can withstand much greater heat and sun because it has thin blades. Mm -hmm. So it's you know kind of the input-output thing. Um, so... You know, I had a, I had a friend of mine from from South Texas call me, and he's like, you know, Mike, I, I I do not 
want St. Augustine? I said, okay. He said, I'm looking at this one grass. It's called Tiff Tough or something like, you know. He said, can you do some research on it? I was like, you really want me to? <laughs> you know, I was like, I know what you have. I've been to your place. I know what you got. Um, so, you know, I was sitting there and I was like, really, I think you ought to go with a St. Augustine and just go with a, you know, a Raleigh or a Floor Tam or something else. Yeah. You know, type of variety in that. And he's like, you know, I really don't want it. I was like, at some point in time, you don't have a choice. So there's a couple of things that I always go. I went back to him and I said, okay, look, Tiff Tough. Fine. Okay. If that was you want, you better make sure that you have eight hours of sun and you have a real mower. And he's like, what do you mean a real mower? I said, R E E L real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rotating real mower. Yeah. And he's like, well, what's the height on it? I said, well, yeah, up to an inch. He goes, well, I don't think I can get my mower that low. I said, you're right. You know, um, there's another one out there that we've got actually at our office in a demonstration plot. It's called celebration. And I actually can withstand a little bit of shade. Um, Typically, your sun, gra- your 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 grasses need eight hours of sun. Saint Augustine can withstand six hours, and then have the rest in shade or dappled sun. Okay. So filtered light through the trees yeah. up underneath. You know, trim your trees up. You know, thin trees out. Allow more sunlight, and you can do it. The last thing is raise your mower up an inch. You raise your mower up an inch, you have more leaf surface for it to catch sunlight. Catch more sun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can't do that with Bermuda. Bermuda gets too leggy. It gets too thin people wouldn't want that in their turf grass no so yeah th- that that's kind of the difference and that's probably some of the i guess the major reason why you see more saint augustine than you do bermuda well, i feel like more neighborhood developments use saint augustine mm-hmm. and yeah. some of the newer ones that don't have any trees planted in them they'll go to say they'll go to a bermuda yeah but but their those trees are going to grow and they're going to take away all that sun and then those yards mm-hmm. are going to face problems yep exactly and I, it never fails i have those people call and say look I've had St. Augustine grass for 20 years at my property, and I'm just having all these problems with it. It's not growing. And so they, I say, you know, go ahead and take a picture of the backyard and send it to me. You know, they take a picture, and lo and behold, there's a where the shade is, there's no grass. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, 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 you know, it's one of those things you just kind of have to work through. Well, and I wonder how many of the like, homeowners or, you know, how many of them think about their tree management mm-hmm. and how much that actually affects their grass yeah. management. Exactly. Not a lot of people think about the trees. And and the, f- the whole thing is, is if they would, you know, periodically trim those trees out, thin them out. I always think of a tree and I see oak trees mm-hmm. as a parachute <laughs> <laughs> because I lived on the coast for so many years. You know, hurricanes were a problem. Um, they basically, if they have too much canopy, they act as a parachute and that, and they will, you know, separate and pull out of the ground and, and blow over because of it. Um, it it just catches. If you have a tree that's properly trimmed and thinned out, air will be able to pass through it much easier. Yeah. Now, what about like with the because we, we live up in Conroe in the woodlands and mm-hmm. and we're you know even where I live in in Cold Spring, mm-hmm. I mean we're in heavily wooded areas. Yep. So maybe some of the trees themselves are thin, mm-hmm. but like as a group as a whole, it's pretty thick. Right. Is there anything we can do there to allow more sunlight through? Or yeah, you, know, you know, removing trees removing understory trees and just allowing for that sunlight to penetrate further in, you know, most time it's pine trees yeah. and then moths of, of underbrush, you know, clearing out some of that underbrush, you know, to allow that sunlight to kind of peek through a little, yeah. you know, that's sometimes what you can do. Uh, oak trees, you know, that best thing to do is thin them out a little bit and, you know, kind of create more sunlight. And sometimes you don't have any choice. Yeah. The last resort, I mean, is you can't plant, if you can't plant St. Augustine, you better plant the ground cover or something that make a park out of it, <laughs> hardscape or, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of the transition of what you have to go to. Well, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we're on, we're on two, almost two acres, just shy of two acres of land. Yeah. And a, a, probably a good fourth of that is, or not fourth, but a fourth of an acre of that is all wooded area. We're on the mm-hmm. border of the Sam Houston forest, right. national forest. And yeah. so it's at times of the year, it's, it's hard especially when it gets closer to the wintertime, we're getting less sun, sunlight on those certain parts of the house mm-hmm. or certain parts of the yard. It, 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 gets it becomes hard. Thin and yeah. yeah doesn't, and that's the thing, too. Just make sure you're raising the mower up. You know, if you got that St. Augustine yeah, type lawn and stuff Augustine. like that, allow more. Yeah. Well, my stepdad wants to plant Bermuda, and mm-hmm. I just I don't know if it'll work. So uh, No, it's you got to have, you know, seven or eight hours of full sun all day long in order for that to really work. Yeah. And, th- and I mean, there's, there's some cool stuff out there. I mean, there's constant uh, improvements as far as varieties are concerned. There's a, um, there's a new uh, St. Augustine that's out right now. 
I, I want to think it. I think it's called Tam Turf or Tex. I can't remember right now. Tam Star. Tam Star. I think is what it is. And it's a new variety of Saint Augustine. Um, the newest variety beyond that one was uh, one that was called um, a Floor Tam. And it was Florida and Texas A and M developed a good turf. And and it. I, I've got somebody that's growing it kind of in an area. They're testing it kind of for me until I can get a good test block going up at the office. But I want to test it because it's got one of the deepest root systems of all the St. Augustines. And, and that's, a big, that's a big thing, big deal mm-hmm. for the grass to grow strong. Right. 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 So. right. Got to have a good root system. And the whole, the whole key to that is less water usage. Okay. So that, that's how to benefit your mm-hmm. – well, no, you know, so that benefits your, your actual yard. Mm-hmm. But how do, you ma- or how do you get a good root system? If you're new to a house or, or if it's a newer house, newer grass, how good do question. you start up the root system? You know, um, a, a lot of things become cost prohibitive. <laughs> I would hate to say, you know, in a new home situation, I would hope, you know, that if they had the availability or ability to do it, I would say come in and bring in six inches, eight inches of compost till it as deep as you can into that area where you're going to plant that grass. Get it smooth, get it level, make sure, you do, make sure your drainage is right, then plant your grass. Okay. And the reason why is you have that gives you a provides a good source, a startup source of nutrients and material for you to get for a longevity purpose. And so that'll help that root system go further down into the soil column, which makes it, you know, withstand droughts and things. I mean, it, it typical turf grass, one inch water per week. Yeah. That's a recommendation. Typical one inch during growing season. And you can actually reduce that. Well, because the root system is essentially like a camel's hump, right? It, it's just it's a giant storage unit mm-hmm. for water. Yep, it pulls it up and stores it. You know, in fact, when grasses go dormant and everything else, it stores a lot of stuff in the root system. So, I mean, and that's that's the whole thing. If that grass has a good base, kind of like a tree, yeah, it won't blow over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it has a good base, it won't blow over. Um, same thing with turf grass. If it has a good base and it's healthy, it it'll withstand droughts better, insect pressures, disease issues. So a long root system and a, a longer length of br- bring the mower up an inch mm-hmm. on the okay yep yeah right. yeah it's it's you know it's kind of different it, you, you just got to main but you got to follow it and you got to stick to it yeah right? yeah exactly exactly you know it, it's and the whole thing is don't panic <laughs> just because there's one brown leaf blade don't panic and go get napalm and try to make it right <laughs> you know um, I, I've I've seen people go out there and they 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 have an issue. And they didn't identify it properly, or they done something where they bought the wrong product. Yeah. And um, like, uh, for instance, atrazine is one of those products that, that is a effective tool mm-hmm. when used properly. Um, it, typically, when you get about above 85, 88 degrees, atrazine can be a little um, hot, what they call hot, and it can actually burn turf grass. Yeah. And and there are and so it needs to be used at cooler times of the year, not in the warmer times. Which you one day we were. 80 degrees and 58 in the morning and the next day we're 90 yeah you know welcome, so. welcome to the texas transition exactly. into fall <laughs> it's called teas <laughs> it's not called yeah so you know and that's one of the things but i you know i kind of giggled at my friend and he kept saying you know well i, I just i don't want saint augustine i was like I, I i think you have no choice you know well and it's because if you transition if you do switch over to something else mm-hmm. you're going to find out that it's as much of a headache as saint augustine if not more that's correct so that's correct so it's just one of those things that happens and you know it, it's it's you got to know what you got. Go to the right places, you know. Um, if if I'm there to sell you something, I'm going to sell it to you. Well, and but, it, you know, we, we've come a long way in technology and advances, mm-hmm. especially in this area. But nature is nature. Sometimes you just can't fight nature. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I think I, that was my theme for about a year's worth of n- news columns, you know. <laughs> just, if, you, if you fight it, you're going to lose. Yeah, Mother Nature will <laughs> trick you every time, too. So uh, uh, It's but, like that and Father Time. They never lose, right? Exactly. But... I uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. We're having a good discussion about some turf grass, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about our uh, plant sale and what we got in our plant sale coming up uh, for our master gardeners. Uh, it's our fall uh, fundraising plant sale tomorrow, starting at eight, going to nine o'clock with a eight to nine o'clock in the morning with a presentation, and then nine at noon with the plant sale. Appreciate you joining us. We'll be back in a moment. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? The Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out IRLoneStar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776. 
with your question. Get seen on TV or YouTube and heard on our podcast, FM and internet radio. Sponsor your local radio station with Lone Star Community Radio. All right, welcome back. Uh, Michael Potter with the, you're listening to the Extension Hour. I'm the Extension Horticulture Agent here with Montgomery County, Agri- Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, we're talking a little bit about grasses today. We talked a little bit about sod web berms and fungal issues. And now I, you know, I listen to the weather and I hear we're having a cool down. So <laughs> it, it, it's, For two days. <laughs> yeah, for two days. <laughs> Welcome to Texas. Exactly. Exactly. The, when we say fall, we mean the temperatures fall <laughs> a little. A little. Yeah, it's kind of more like tea season. So, uh, but, you know, it's uh, with all the little issues, you know, weather impacts so much of what we do. Mm-hmm. Um our turf grasses are highly impacted by their moisture and the humidity uh, that we get. You know, we get 50 some odd inches of rainfall a year. Uh, that right there is alone to tell me that if it was a one inch a week, hmm, that's enough. We don't even have to water. Exactly. So most of the time I always tell people, you know, that, that irrigation that comes out of that pipe should be only supplemental. So people that, yeah, so supplemental would be the right way. But I feel like people would come back and argue and say, well, yeah, we, we may get 52 inches a, a rain a year, mm-hmm. but at certain months during the summer we only yeah. get, you know, two inches two or three inches. inches. Yep. So it, would it be okay to water a little bit here and there during yeah, yeah. that time? Oh, definitely. You know, the whole thing is is, is that you want the grass to sustain itself, okay? We, we all want that. We would love to have, have fake turf, I guess. You know? <laughs> um, I've actually had people say that, you know, forget this. I'm going to put fake turf in. Well, at 10 dollars a square foot, I don't think that's really feasible, but okay. Um, but people the, will do it, though. The people I will do you. it, yeah. But, you know, there, there's, there's a negative to every aspect of that, um, and, and – <laughs> with fake turf, yeah, yeah it, th- there's some problems with it. Tur- cleaning. Really? Yeah. Disinfecting. You to va- do you have to vacuum it? Va- vacuum, disinfect, <laughs> you know. You got animals and everything that, you know, think about kids. If you don't disinfect it and they go out there and they walk across it, I mean, of course, same can be said with regular grass too. But with regular grass, you have all those microbes and everything in there that help break a lot of that stuff down. Yeah. So um, the other thing is, is that temperatures. The, they actually did a study. Um, it was out of uh, Georgia. They went out to a parking lot and took a heat gun, you know, tested the heat there, went out to a turf infield on a baseball field, and then regular grass. And it was like a 100-degree day. It was like 150 on the turf. It was like 102 on the grass and 130-something on the, on the asphalt. Really? So the, the the fake grass was the highest, highest one? temperature, yeah. It, and I've, I've always, when I teach that class during the February uh, about turf grass, I always put that up there because they actually have the pictures of the, the gun, you know, sitting there. And it's like, whoa. I wonder how that would compare against sand, too. Because mm-hmm. i got to oh. imagine sand gets real. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, you think of walking on a hot surface oh, in the yeah. summer day. It's, it's always like a beach sand but Ooh. or asphalt. But you can't. I, I would, couldn't even imagine walking across fake grass oh. like that. And yeah. Just, my feet would. Smoking. Sand. Yeah, it, it's my, my son plays baseball and you know they always play on well not always but they play on some of those artificial fields and uh it gets hot especially during the middle of the summer you're playing summer ball it gets hot go for a dive and catch yep 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 yep. it gets hot and uh it's no wonder you can't gain any weight you know because you (laughs) lose all of it you know um because it's like sitting in an oven playing out in the outfield that's exactly right yeah it it really has a as a heat you know kind of reflective capability that really it kind of stinks you know Mm. um so, yeah, there's some negative side to that. Um, the whole thing is with turf grass, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to get rid of it. Well, turf grass does serve a purpose. Number one, cooling effect. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it has that purpose. You know, yeah, if you replace it with landscape and everything, more power to you. It's just what kind of space do you need to do what you need? I mean, what do you need? Not what you want, but yeah. what, you, what do you need? Uh, if you have kids and stuff like that, yeah, they need a yard to play in. So, you know, maybe that's not a good situation at that time, you know, to start reducing turf, but you know i can see that in the future expand and change and things like that but so heat you know reducing heat number one number two it helps with water penetration down to the soil which helps recharge our aquifers really it's a filtering system so as it rains water fills up the soil and then as that water fills up the soil it leaches down and it goes down into the water table that's i mean we've got aquifers here that are millions of years old yeah you know yeah, I mean that's that's how it works. And does it does it 
I, I guess I don't, I don't really know how it works, but I guess does it like when you say filter, does it filter any of the bad stuff out or? You think about it. I mean, it's going to be traveling a long way for a long time. Yeah. So, you know, as it moves through things, it's some, you know, half-lives of, of, of certain elements and chemicals and things like that. Um, for instance, BT, okay, mm-hmm. it's a bacteria. It is naturally broken down by UV light, and it, it has a relatively short lifespan in the environment. So eventually it's either going to get bound up by a nutrient or a molecule or something in the soil and held on to while the water passes through. Mm-hmm. You know, and the same thing with some chemicals and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, uh, I did, I had to do a lot of research right after Harvey because we had people calling us and saying, you know, what do I do with my vegetable garden? Oh yeah. We, we, you know, we had four feet of water, you know, what am I going to be able to, well, you know, in those cases you had a lot of stuff that was flowing downstream of, you know, it could have been gasoline, oils, who knows, sewage from, you know, septic systems, et cetera. Well, uh, a lot of the research I looked at and everything, they, they, they said 90 days if it sits for like a week. That's, that's all you would need is 90 days, and then it would be disappear. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to vegetable gardens, it needs to be a full season. A full season. Especially if it was over a week. What about like some of the – and I know that you normally handle the smaller areas, but mm-hmm. what about like the large farmers? I mean, yeah. are we going to see a huge effect from that? You know, not necessarily – well – uh, from a standpoint of environmental impact, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the co- cotton crops down in South Texas were destroyed. I've got they've got aerial photos of big cotton modules that were out in the field that were completely blown off and Ugh. blown apart. Um, and working down there as I did, and and knowing the area, it's it's it is quite decimating. You know, uh, as far as you know, the impact of what those those rains and winds did. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the crops that we grow in Texas from on a large scale are are food type crops for animals they're feed okay. type products they're not really uh the consumable <clears throat> human except, consumable yeah human yeah. consumable foods uh cotton you know that that's a you know they yeah hey, you know t-shirt cotton, prices t-shirt. are gonna go back, uh, back up yeah so you know it, it does uh big weather events like that always impact our agriculture and um and and like it or not we're involved in agriculture yeah you know i that was one of the things when, when we used to teach kids we used to walk into the classroom and 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 ask them, you know, you know, name something that's produced by a plant. And, you know, the kids will kind of look around and they're like, uh, said, by the way, you're, you're wearing jeans? Yeah, it's a cotton plant, you know. Uh, oh, the paper on your desk. It's a tree. It's from a tree. You know, and it's like kind of go oh wow the pencil by the way yeah <laughs> you the know desk you're sitting at <laughs> yeah. yeah you don't you don't realize it yeah. Um, yeah. you don't realize it sometimes but you know everything we do is involved we're we're involved in agriculture no matter what we do and uh yeah the impact as far as you know there were quite a few uh smaller type companies and stuff around that that got impacted as far as the amount of water they got they mm-hmm. lost a lot of crop um or crop was damaged in some way shape or form just amount of humidity through disease and things like that um so it messed with production and you know therefore we've we've seen a little bit of increase in some of our you know but from the personal from the from the house standpoint Mm -hmm. a full season on on personal crops yeah if it sat for over a week if it sat in in like in the high water Mm -hmm. yeah because once you get you know stagnation and, and you have a lot of unwanted organics and things in there it just takes a while to break down um you know that they reckon one of them said they recommend uh tilling mm. and then letting the uv light for 69 days kind of do a solarization with a clear plastic you know seal it up if you have like raised beds or something uh you know seal it down to where the sunlight will still penetrate through that clear plastic that helps solarize it and break things down because of heat yeah um and then you know till it up again and do the same thing but uh if if, if it sat for a week uh, more than a week or two weeks or something like that, you know, they, they recommended leaving it for a full season. There's places on the highway six that are still underwater. I know. And I, yeah, yeah, a lot of those, it's just, I know there's a really a golf course we, we played at for years and years growing up. And I, I don't, I can't imagine if they're going to yeah. come back from this one. So, yeah. cause that's gotta be challenging from an agricultural standpoint to get that golf course back up and ready. So, right. yeah. You know, one of the things that one of the shows that we did here, um, we were talking about SJRA, you know, the Santa Santa River Authority, the release of water downstream and things like that. You know, uh, they did the very best they could to basically absorb as much water before releasing it downstream. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they, they, all the rain and everything that occurred, and they have good information of what came in, how it was stopped, 
what what comes in from other tributaries and other areas, other inflows. And it was just, I mean, they made a good decision according to their protocol. They they, they followed their protocol of what they were supposed to do um, and tried to minimize flood and damage the best they could. And and the whole thing is, is that, you know, we all look for somebody to blame when Mother Nature <laughs> It's Mother Nature. I mean, again. When, when you get 50 to 60 inches mm-hmm. of rain, there's only so much you can do. There's, right. There's only so much we can handle. Right. Well, in, in fact, you know, our, our counterparts, my counterparts that are over in Harris County, the Harris County Extension Office, uh, they had eight foot of water in their building. And they're over in the Bear Creek area. Yeah, that's the Bear Creek Country yeah. Country Club. That was the golf course yep. I was talking yeah, I was about. Figuring, that's what I was so. thinking. I was like, I wonder if it's there. Yeah, but it, that area. It, at eight foot of water? I've got a speeding ticket at a, at a courthouse in that area, too. Mm-hmm. They're still underwater, and, and I'm yep. still waiting to hear when I'm, my my actual court case is going to be. So Hopefully the, hopefully the records got lost. <laughs> I was going to say, hopefully it went downstream. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they, they had all that rain. And you think about, you know, 15, 20 years ago, all the development that has happened out beyond that, it wasn't there. No. You know, the the whole thing is, I mean, you know, I hate to say it, we either have to, you know, we can get into all kinds of debates of what needs to be done and everything else, but the natural land, its ability with those grasses and everything else to filter that water and push it down in the soil and get it into our aquifers, is it's important. Yeah. I mean, it, it's needed at yeah. times. In know? fact, we have a water runoff display at the office that we've we used to use um it, you would actually take bare ground you could take grass and then maybe something else you know like a mulch or something else and put it on there and you can actually see how you can simulate an inch an hour rain and it filters through it and you can see bare ground it's all the sediment and everything else yeah. falls to the bottom and then how grass how it percolates through in very little water it just slowly comes through yeah and then how mulch how it just helps it you know, we've done studies out in the fields and watched how water can percolate through the soil system. And there's and nothing that we can really do to increase yeah. the, the, the rate at which it, it flows through there, huh? Mm-mm. No, it's the soil. It just is what it, it is. It is what it is. And, uh, you know, the, the whole thing is is we build subdivisions and p- concrete parking lots, and we expect the water to go down the little pipe that goes downstream, you know. It's <laughs> it's. I mean, it's the sad those, reality. Those things are designed yeah. for an inch a day, not, right. not, not an not, inch an hour. Yeah, yeah, two, four, four inches an hour, five inches an hour, like some people got. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, when we come back, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the plant. So I'll finally shut up and let you ah. get back to it. <laughs> no, it's good. It's all good. Uh, well, I'm Michael Potter. I'm the horticulture agent here in Montgomery County talking to you from the Extension Hour right here in downtown Conroe. We'll be back in a moment. Remember to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on your computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. Lone Star Community Radio broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back. I'm here at the Extension Hour. My name is Michael Potter with the Texas A&M Agri Life Extension Service. Uh, today we kind of, man, we run a gamut. We talked about turf grass. We talked about problems and water issues, and man, we're we're covering just about everything. Pretty well, good. I was telling you, I was telling him, I was speaking to him off air, and I was saying, you know, I'm like the the best example of the uninformed consumer, you know. <laughs> so I'm I'm a good one to have on as as the placate dummy. <laughs> And eh, nah, we can all learn something, you know, every day is a learning experience. And, and, and that, that's kind of the way I take it. You know, I, I'm, there's no way I can know everything, but I can know a little bit about everything. And, you know, that's kind of a good attitude to have. And, I, you know, the fact is, is that's kind of why I'm in this business. I, I enjoy helping people and help solving their problems and, and doing and what I can. you still learn stuff too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I still, I mean, things change on a daily basis and, uh, you know, technology and, breeding programs with turf grass and whatever else uh, plants etc so it's yeah every day's a learning experience um kind of change gears a little bit i want to talk about our plant sale that we got coming up um our master gardeners uh we've got probably the largest master gardener program in the state of texas here in montgomery county it is a volunteer program that is uh, sponsored through texas a&m agri-life extension service it was created back in the the late 70s here in texas in fact montgomery county Master Gardeners were, was the first Master Gardener organization in the state of Texas. So uh, even though they started it in, originally in, like, Oregon, 
we had the first Master Garden organization organization in the state of Texas. Did, was it started up by A and M? No, well, in Texas, it, it, it came from Oregon. And uh, what they did is they, they said, oh, wow, they got this really cool program over here. Let's try to see what we kind of do with it. Yeah. So they actually ran it a couple of years and kind of piloted it here in Montgomery County and then got the first organization started. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. It's um, How long has it been around now? Yeah, oh, gosh. So I think uh, their first classes were in like 78, but they actually, I think, got it as a confirmed organization like in 80 or 81, so they're, you know, roughly – 35 years 40 years yeah so, so it's it's great it, it's a it's a great you know deal it helps us out in extension we rely heavily on our volunteers to help us disseminate you know this research-based information and provide education to the public um you know we do we've got a whole bunch of stuff we've got what we call junior master gardeners it's a it's a youth education program that we take to the schools it has its own curriculum it's awesome and it's it's cool it, it touches on all kind of like doing like a welding shop almost. Yeah, yeah 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 and we so we take a lot of the plant or you know uh, horticulture type information to schools and we can utilize that that curriculum in schools to help with teaching teaks and mm-hmm. some of these other you know programs or any kind of science type uh, stuff with and plants um, then we got you know we curriculum enrichment stuff that we do outside that you know our master gardeners are talented in many ways. I mean, we've got some that are geologists, astrophysicists. I mean, I just never know who I'm going to run into some days at the office and, and you know, what their background is. It's uh, an area of smart, smart people. Yes, exactly. I would not belong. <laughs> hey, I've got some of them up there. I go, I, I kid you not, there, there's some of them. When I get a question that I can't handle, I, I've got somebody who is a specialist in that area somewhere. <laughs> so I, I utilize my resources when I can. I learned that last week. If, if you go back and listen to last Friday's show, we had uh, Mr. Potter on as well, and he had a man that just knew everything about ants. It was unbelievable. I, I had I never thought I – I just thought an ant was a dumb old ant, you know? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. He is a Dr. Paul Nestor. Yep, he does. He knows a lot of good stuff, and you know we constantly get those kind of phone calls. So tomorrow's thing, it's free, right? Yes, free to the public, except when you start to go purchase plants. Obviously, <laughs> but yes, you can get in for free. Yeah, you get in for free. Uh, like I said, from eight o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning, we I, I stand up with one of my master gardeners, who is a absolute. She's I I love her to death. Uh, she's helped me out with our presentations in the morning. She does more of the native section, and and sometimes she jumps in in the middle and says, "Hey, wait a minute! I grow this plant, and this is what." He, okay, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, Linda Crum is her name, and she'll be helping me out tomorrow morning uh, from eight to nine, and then uh, the plant sale starts at nine. Any specialty plants that you are highlighting? Gosh, or? yeah, we've got. You know, I always do well. I. When I got here, of course, <laughs> learning the plant list of what Montgomery County can grow versus what I could grow in South Texas was a big undertaking. <laughs> I went from an eight-page plant list in South Texas to a 25-page <laughs> plant list. So, um, But, yeah, I've got some you know plants that I always kind of – I just basically call them the agent's picks of the plant sale. You know, uh, Rangoon Creeper, which is a type of uh, uh, a vine. It has some beautiful red flowers, and as the flowers kind of get older, some of them turn white, and they have, like, red streaks in them and stuff. I mean, it's just it's cool. a beautiful kind of plant, kind of big leaf. Um, all the hibiscus-type plants, you know, we – have a lot of the natives uh you know they're going to be perennial types where they're going to they're going to die back during the winter but they'll come back up and uh so we've got some of those and let's see uh, the other one is uh, there was a, a cow muley grass that it's like called white cloud i think is what it was called and it's just the plumes on it it's just like a white cloud it's beautiful very white and it's a it's an ornamental grass for the you know the, for the landscape you know for yeah. it you know gets two or three feet tall that one and then you know there's a there's a plant that i was kind of made fun of by our our purchasing agent because we went to one of the when i first got here we went to one of the places to purchase some plants because we unfortunately we don't have all the room to grow everything but for this sale we actually can grow more than 70 percent of our plants yeah um but we went down to this one nursery and there's this plant called sweet almond verbena and it's it gets pretty big and it's kind of a small tree but the bloom they, they just have this smell to them and it's just I don't like sweet almonds. I would, yeah, exactly. Kind of like yeah. I I go over and I'd hug it. You know, <laughs> and so, you know I want to bathe in. Yeah, this. I was like, I want to bathe in this stuff. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, scent to it. So yeah, I mean, there's there's stuff like that. We've got uh, 
lettuces and and some of the vegetables the leafy vegetables and everything the coal crops for for winter type growing uh lots of herbs uh we have some trees and and some shrub type things that we're also selling uh any kind of ground cover shade plants we're talking about shade yeah yep so if you can't grow grass in the shade we got some shade plants for you but um uh, uh, we uh that our master gardeners do a great job of putting this on and uh, typically if you come up there we'll have about 100 to 150 master gardeners at the plant sale out there helping people that's a lot of smart people yep. that know a lot about plants <laughs> <laughs> and we got i think we have a little over or close to 5,000 plants individual plants that'll be for sale tomorrow um, and this is just one of them we do yeah. one, one in the fall we do one in january where we do fruit trees yeah uh, and that that one's a great one to come to unless it freezes <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, we actually did have icicles one year. <laughs> We're like, wow, this is going to be interesting. And sure enough, man, people came. And uh, I think we had a record crowd that year. It, it's it's funny amazing. How it works like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we also do one in the spring as well. And that's our biggest plant sale where we have an upwards of, you know, 15,000 plants. Yeah, so, I mean, go on out to, to this tomorrow. Go see Mr. Mr. Potter. Give his yep. little speech in the morning. Yep. Buy some plants. And yep. then. You can come on out for the nighttime fun over here at the Cajun Conroe Catfish Festival. There you go. So, buy, buy plants, get them at home. Get them yeah, home. Get, yeah, them, get, get them, them where, get them where they need to go. And then come rest and relax. Come up here, listen to some music, and, and have some fun. No, what, what's better than doing a little bit of yard work and then relaxing, right? Exactly. <laughs> having, a, having a cold brew of some sort. Exactly. Exactly. But it, uh, best way to get a, get a hold or get any more information? Yep. Uh, the Master Gardeners have a website, and in fact, our plant list is up on that website. It's mcmga.com. And uh, they have that website up there. We also have a Facebook for our Master Gardeners. Uh, and uh, you, you can look Montgomery County Master Gardeners. And then if you want to give us a call at 536-539-7824, that is our Master Gardener hotline. All right. And, and guys, if you ever you want to go back and be like, oh, what did he say about you know Bermuda grass? Go check out the podcasted version and the YouTube yep. version on uh, YouTube and Google Play and iTunes, and it'll be under uh, the Extension Hour. There we go. So, and just remember today's date. That's right. That's right. Appreciate it. And appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, without further ado, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I'll be uh, at the plant sale tomorrow helping other people out and hopefully getting some plants sold so we can support our demonstration gardens and, and better distribute our information to the public. Thank you much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Have a good day. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936 647 3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.